problem, doesn't it? Reality, infinitely more subtle than what you're just seeing or hearing. And if there was a more subtle reality than the book 1984, I don't know what it is. If you haven't read that book in a while, you should go read it. It's pretty amazing. Some of the things you will pick up on in that, particularly if you start thinking about them, they're remarkable. For example, the the use of the confessions over Winston's walk home in the initial part of the movie. While those are minor in the film, in the in the book, those are three of the reasons why Winston is struggling to believe the party. Because he knows that those three men are not guilty of what they're being charged with. He knows that. The proletariats, the proles, coming from the Greek word to mean produce offspring. And you notice that the party is forbidden to have sexual relations while the proles reproduce. It's interesting stuff. So, my news feed is full of tweets and Facebook posts and the likes of that. And the other day, this tweet came across my my system. It's from Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, better known as AOC. And of course, to most conservatives, those are fighting words, but here's what she had to say. This week in Congress, Dems passed a $1.9 trillion COVID package to deliver stimulus checks with dependents, exclamation point, cut child poverty in half, Extend $300 unemployment insurance, prevent cuts in state and local services, largest ever investment in native communities, etc. GOP took a week to read the cat in the hat. Now, look, of course she's playing to her base. And for our example here, I want to be clear that the only reason I'm using her tweet is because these are the tweets that show up in my feed. I'm absolutely certain that you could go to a conservative politician and find similar things. My question to you is, how do you know that she is not being truthful? Let me, let me ask you that again. How do you know that she is not being truthful? If, if you're on the conservative side, in fact, I asked this question to my friend, my friend Bill Mick yesterday, <laughs> how do you know she's lying? Well, her lips move, Dave, or in this case, her tweet moves. Okay, if we take the joke out of it, the, the, the traditional politician joke out of it, how do you know that she is not telling the truth? They did pass a 1.9 COVID package, COVID relief package, delivered stimulus checks with dependents, cut child poverty in half, extend $300 unemployment insurance, prevents cut in state and local services, largest ever investment in Native community. How do you know that these things are not True. In four years from now, when hopefully all of this COVID crap has been long forgotten, um, how then do we know that what she said in her tweet of March 11th is not true or is true? How would we know at that point whether these things are true or not true? And let's take it even further. Let's go a generation out. Let's go 20 years from now. 20 years from now, looking back at this, will anyone even know if child poverty was cut in half and we prevented cuts to state and local and services, state and local services? Will we even know? And more importantly, how will we know? How would we know if it were true or if it was not true? 
how would we have any clue as to these things? Now, you might know, and, and, and that's what you're going to say to me. I can hear the emails coming in already. Dave, of course we know she's a liar. She's an inverter or liar. She's like Pelosi, blah, blah, blah. I understand that. But in 20 years, I'm going to be 78, and my parents will no doubt be gone by then. Some of you listening today may not be here. I may not be here. Who knows? People who are here right now, who are cognizant of what's going on, may not be here then. And people who today are not really cognizant of what's going on are going to look back at the history books and go, okay, what happened? Who, she said, that they cut child poverty in half. How do we know they didn't? In the book 1984, and we are talking about where we are going still, in the book 1984, Winston is trying to find some things out. He's trying to figure some things out. And while I love the movie 1984 of John Hurt, don't get me wrong, that is one of my favorite movies of all time. I love that movie. It is very well done cinematically, story-wise. It does lose some things in the translation from the book. And one of the things it loses, I think, is what is it that Winston is actually trying to do? In the movie, he's kind of a, I don't know, disgruntled employee. He's a person who is tricked by O'Brien into becoming a traitor um, by the secret police, as it were. Whereas in the book, it's much more subtle than that. In the book, it's much more, he has questions. And the questions begin with those three confessions, which he knows are false. He knows for a fact. He knows that those confessions, what they're saying in those confessions is completely untrue. I'm not going to go into why, but he knows it. It's not even a, it's not even a, I think, it's not even a, I heard. He was there. He knows. And so he begins to question some things. Not necessarily that the party is doing these things. He's asking the question, how did they do this? How did it get to the point where he who controls the present controls the past? And he who controls the past controls the future. How did they do this? He's asking that question that he translates or or uses the question, which is, I'm told that life is better now than it was before the revolution. I'm told that I'm better now than I would have been before the party did all this for you. And all I want to know is, is that true? Was life worse before the revolution than it is now? Now, you might say, that's a simple question, Dave. All you got to do is go to Winston. All you got to do is go to the history books, right? But the history books defy, describe a world that, to Winston, seems appalling. People are starving. People don't have shoes. People are being worked to death. The capitalists, with their top hats, are pushing people into the streets that they don't like. But it has a ring to it that he doesn't really... Trust. He has this. He has this ring to it that he's he's uncomfortable with, and he doesn't know. And he comes to the to the clear and easy conclusion that how do I know that these history books are telling me the truth? How do I know that it isn't true? How do I know what the party is saying is true, or how do I know what it's saying is not true? How do I know this? Because I do know that this confession was a lie. It's a simple question. Was life better? Was life worth? Worse. And he knows that there are almost no party members who can answer that question for him. In fact, the party members, the people who were the revolutionaries, who could answer those questions, well, oddly enough, there were three of them. And those three were later accused of being counter-revolutionaries. They were rehabilitated and brought back. And... Before he could ask them the question, was life better? Was, was this true? Before he can ask them the question, 
they reoffend and they're forced to confess. This is what he's listening to as he walks home. And of course, they're shot in the Chestnut Tree Cafe as they're crying, realizing that they love Big Brother. It's, it's a fascinating cycle, but but Winston is stuck with this question: Is it better? So the only thing he can do is go to the proles. He, it's the only <laughs> they're the only ones who would know. Because there are no party members who who are left who would know. In fact, Big Brother's the only one left from the Revolutionary Era. He's the only one that would know. And what's he going to say if I could even find him and talk to him? So he decides to go to the proletariat areas, where in the movie they describe him visit the prostitute and the shop and those kinds of things. And that's true, he does. But he also goes to a bar, a pub, because at first he doesn't really know why. But there in the pub, he sees this old man sitting there, and the scene is rather lengthy. The old man, he knows that the man is old because, number one, he looks old, but everybody looks old. But he knows he's old because he's talking about how we used to buy beer in pints, not liters. And two pints is just enough, but two liters is too much. Or or one liter is two half liters. Is too much. Why can't I get a pint? Why can't you pour me a pint? And they go through this whole rigor more with the bartender about how, you know, this is plenty. You eat this, or drink this. Winston offers to buy him a drink. That's got a beer. Let's sit over here at this table and let's talk. And in what I think is probably one of the more fascinating scenes of the book, he tries to ask the old man that question. Look, you're old. <laughs> it's basically what he says. You're old. Was life better before the revolution or not? And the old man keeps getting distracted by stuff. He gets distracted by top hats. He gets distracted by the House of Lords. He gets distracted by being pushed into the into the streets. I mean, but Winston has this uneasy feeling that it's not distraction. That it's not the old man doesn't know the answer. It's he won't answer the question. Because, well, he doesn't want to admit to remembering all this. Because if he admits to it, what's he going to say? (laughs) Life was better before the party. How did they change all this? Got a new coffee cup. Sorry for those of you watching. It doesn't work as well. How does the party do all this? And that's the other thing that that Winston is bothering with. How do they manage to fool all this? Well, again, 85% of the population is the proles who are consumed with gambling, sex, and drinking. That's what they do. That Then they work, and from the time they're 12 years old, they work until they die. And they die young because, for the most part, they're still getting, you know, they're still fodder for the war, or the steamers as they come over, or the cirrhosis of the liver, or whatever. And by the way, they don't get to drink gin. They can only drink beer. The... Trolls, on the other hand, though, are the manpower. Without the proles, the 15% who are the party have nothing to rule over. And they have simply distracted the proles to the point where they don't care about anything except for gambling, sex, and, and booze. They're distracted by their simplicity of their life. And since the party generally leaves them alone, they have a perception that they are free and... This is what they've known. And Winston discovers this in his journeys, and and this is what doesn't come out in the movie. This is what Winston discovers, is that these people, if there is any hope for overturning the party, it has to lie with the proles. I mean, the the party's not going to, the party can't do it, can't undo itself. Anybody that could have is gone. So it has to come from the proles, and the proles just don't care. They do not... (laughs) The people just don't care. They are distracted by the distractions of everyday life and entertainment. Can Winston ever find the answer to his question, was life better before than it is now? Well, what does that have to do with AOC's tweet? Well, like I asked the question, how would you know? 100 years from now, 75 years from now, 50 years from now, looking back at that, do you think the history books are going to detail what the child poverty level was in the United States. And let's 
let's assume that the child poverty level in the United States in 50 years is worse than it is now. We're just assuming. I'm not saying it would be. Do you think the government would admit that? Do you think the government would acknowledge that? Do you think you're going to find that in the history books written for kids? Or let's say it's better than it was. They'll trumpet that fact, won't they? And, and, and AOC's tweet will be right up there at the front. See, we cut it in half while the, while the Republican Party, the opposition party, was reading cat in the hat. Look what we did. We saved children. How will you know? You and I were there. So we will say, that's ridiculous. If our great-grandchildren ask us, we'll say, it's absurd. Or will we? Will we say, that's absurd, or... Will we sit on the bar stool with our half liter of beer and reminisce about the stranger things and the clothes we used to wear and the music we used to sing and the dances we used to do rather than actually answer the question that our child or young people might be asking us because what might happen? I don't know where we're headed, and I've said this already. I don't know what kind of government we're going to have in 10, 20, 50 years. I don't know. I will, probably won't be here, so I don't really worry that too much about it. It's not going to be my my job to take care of it. All I can do is infuse my son with what I know, why I know it, and hope that it's still available for him to see downstream. And believe me, I truly hope that. I don't know what it'll be, but I do know how it will achieve its control. I do know this. How you might say, well, this is what I was saying yesterday, the digital gulag. See, I don't know if you caught yes, the day before yesterday's show, the last show we did, about the, uh, what the heck did we call it? Two shows ago. One, whatever the last show was, uh, the pendulum show. In the opener of that, there's a clip from... AP News, where the reporter is talking about how the government is charging the Oath Keepers with plotting the January 6th insurrection. He said with the air quotes and great sarcasm because it wasn't. One of the things she says is the government has their encrypted conversations. And it's like, I mean, she just blows right by that. It doesn't bother her as a reporter that the government has encrypted communications. We sit here now encrypting our communications. Rod and I use an encrypted app, mostly because it works better than anything else that we've got, and it's easier to use. We, we talk every day over this encrypted app. I use a VPN. You probably do, too. We think to ourselves, we're secure, but we're not. The, the government can see everything you do. And believe me, They are watching you. I know Big Brother is this pie-in-the-sky idea, 1984, but it's real, folks. And I don't say that as a conspiracy theorist. I don't say that as someone who has no reason to say it. I have a very good reason to say it. I was warned this week by someone in the government that there were things that I needed to be considering because retirement is lurking. And if we want to make it to retirement, we don't want to be on the wrong side of what's going on. I don't know how serious to take that warning, but I do know that the Oath Keepers encrypted communications didn't do them any good at all, did it? They will use, the government will use, the party, whatever it becomes, will use your own posts, your own words against you. Just like cancel culture goes back 20, 10, 20, 15 years to find stuff that you said or they said all that time ago and then hammers them with it. The same thing is going to happen to those of us who today hold conservative or even libertarian values. You like, you, you have guns? Well, believe me, there's an FFL filed somewhere for the sale of that gun. The government can look that up and come to your house and say, you've got a gun that we've told you to turn in. Why didn't you turn it in? And you can say to me all you want, well, I will resist. Maybe you will. 
But the vast majority of people, not a chance. A few well-broadcast and well-demonstrated arrests on TV at 4 a.m. in the morning, and guess what? A few well-placed pressure points. Hmm. Boy, it'd be really a shame if your child didn't get into college because of your political views. Hmm. Be a real shame, wouldn't it? Believe me, they're already watching every one of us. Even if you're encrypting, they're watching it. And they're going to use that to come back to us to say, see, you are in opposition to what we want, what we've told you you need to be. You are you are on the outside looking in. Now, you can, you can continue to assert your rights and, and do all that kind of stuff. And you might make you feel better. But ultimately, you're going to be like the guy standing in the crosswalk going, hey, I have the right of way. And the car doesn't care. Car doesn't car doesn't even know you're there. You may be right, but and while it's easy to say, well, we all wish we were George Washington and Thomas Jefferson and Nathan Hale, the reality of it is most of us are not going to be. Most of us are not going to have those heroic values. Most of us are not going to stand up, salute the flag, and say, I regret that I have what but one life to give for my country. And even those of us who do do that, and I imagine there will be more than a few, you think they're going to make it into the history books the next time? And even if they do, how will you know if it's true or not in 20 years? And if they're not in the history books, how will you know that their story was true? We have people now today who are questioning the values of our heroic era. That's part of the Tetley cycle is to, to denigrate those and bring them down. And destroy them. This is how, 1984, the book, this is how the party destroyed those internal supports and destroyed the, the very ability to even ask the question, is life better now? That question was ultimately, utterly, completely, and totally destroyed. And as Winston notes himself, in a few years, he won't even be able to ask that question. And that's kind of how we got there, isn't it? When Winston walks into the bar and sits down, buys a couple of liters, and says to an old man, let me ask you a question. The old man's pale blue eyes moved from the darts board to the bar and from the bar to the door of the gents, as though it were there in the bar room that he expected the changes to have occurred. The beer was better, he said finally, and cheaper. When I was a young man, mild beer, wallop we used to call it, was four pence a pint. That was before the war, of course. Which war was that, said Winston. It's all wars, said the old man vaguely. He took up his glasses, and his shoulders straightened again. As wish he knew the very best of the earth. In his lean throat, the sharp-pointed Adam's apple made a surprisingly rapid up-and-down movement, and the beer vanished. Winston went to the bar and came back with two more half-liters. The old man appeared to have forgotten his prejudice against drinking a full liter. "'You are much, very much older than I am,' said Winston." You must have been a grown man before I was born. You can remember what it was like in the old days before the revolution. People of my age don't really know anything about those times. We can only read about them in books, and what it says in the books may not be true. I should like your opinion on that. The history books say that life before the revolution was completely different from what it is now. There was the most terrible oppression, injustice, poverty worse than anything we can imagine. Here in London, the great mass of the people never had enough to eat from birth to death. Half of them hadn't even boots on their feet. They worked twelve hours a day. They left school at nine. They slept ten in a room. And at the same time, there were very few people, only a few thousands, 
The capitalists, they were called, who were rich and powerful. They owned everything that there was to own. They lived in great, gorgeous houses with thirty servants. They rode about in motor cars and four horse carriages. They drank champagne. They wore top hats. The old man brightened suddenly. Top hats, he said. Funny you should mention them. Same thing come into my head already yesterday. Don't know why. I was just thinking, I ain't seen a top hat in years. Gone right out to have. Last time I wore one was my sister-in-law's funeral. That was, and I couldn't give you a date, but it must have been fifty years ago. Of course, it was only odd for the occasion, you understand. It isn't very important about the top hats, said Winston patiently. The point is, these capitalists, they and a few lawyers and priests and so forth, who lived on them, were the lords of the earth. Everything existed for their benefit. You, the ordinary people, the workers, were their slaves. They could do what they liked with you. They could ship you off to Canada like cattle. They could sleep with your daughters if they chose. They could order you to be flogged with something called a cat o nine tails. You had to take your cap off when you passed them. Every capitalist went about with a gang of lackeys who, the old man brightened again. Lackeys, he said. Now there's a word I haven't heard in ever so long. Lackeys. That regular takes me back. That does. I recollect oh, donkeys years ago. I used to sometimes go to Hyde Park for a Sunday afternoon to hear the blokes making speeches. Salvation Army, Roman Catholics, Jews, Indians, all sorts was there. There was this one bloke, well, I couldn't give you his name, but a real powerful speaker he was. He didn't off give it to him. Lackeys, he says. Lackeys of the bourgeoisie. Flunkies of the ruling class. Parasites, that was another one of them. And hyenas, he definitely called them hyenas. Of course, he was referring to the Labour Party, you understand. Winston had the feeling that they were talking at cross purposes. What I really want to know is this, he said. Do you feel that you have more freedom now than you had in those days? Are you treated more like a human being? In the old days, the, the rich people, the people at the top. The House of Lords, put in the old man reminiscently. The House of Lords, if you like. What I'm asking is, were those people able to treat you as an inferior simply because they were rich and you were poor? Is it a fact, for instance, that you had to call them sir and take off your cap when you pass them? The old man appeared to think deeply. He drank off about a quarter of his beer before answering. Yes, he said. They liked you to touch your cap to them. Showed respect, like. I didn't agree with it myself, but I'd done it often enough. I'd do, as you might say. And was it usual? I'm only quoting what I've read in the history books. Was it usual for these people and their servants to push you off the pavement into the gutter? One of them pushed me once, said the old man. I recollect it as if it was yesterday. It was boat race night. Terribly rowdy they used to get on boat race night. And I bumped into a young bloke on Shaftesbury Avenue. Quite a jet he was. Dress shirt, top hat, black overcoat. He was kind of zigzagging across the pavement, and I bumps into him accidental like. He says, Why can't you look where you're going? He says, I say, Do you think you've bought the bleeding pavement? He says, I'll twist your bloody head off you get fresh with me. I says, You drunk. I'll give you in charge in half a minute, I says. And if you believe me, he puts his hand on my chest. And gives me a shove as pretty near put me under the wheels of a bus. Well, I was young in them days, and I was going to have fetched him, only... A sense of helplessness took hold of Winston. The old man's memory was nothing but a rubbish heap of details. One could question him all day without getting any real information. The party's histories might still be true, after a fashion. They might even be completely true. He made one last attempt. Perhaps I have not made myself clear, he said. What I'm trying to say is this. You have been alive a very long time. You lived half your life before the revolution. In 1925, for instance, you were already grown up. Would you say, from what you can remember, that life in 1925 was better than it is now, or worse? If you could choose, would you prefer to live then, 
or now? The old man looked meditatively at the darts board. He finished up his beer more slowly than before. When he spoke, it was with a tolerant, philosophical air, as though the beer had mellowed him. I know what you expect me to say, he said. You expect me to say I'd sooner be young again. Most people would say they'd sooner be young if you asked them. You got your health and your strength when you're young. When you get to my time of life, you ain't never well. I suffer something wicked from my feet, and my blood is just terrible. Six and seven times a night it's got me out of bed. On the other hand, there's great advantages in being an old man. You ain't got the same worries. No truck with women, that's the great thing. I ain't had a woman for near on thirty a year, if you'd credit it. No I wanted to, what's more. Winston sat back against the windowsill. It was no use in going on. He was about to buy some more beer when the old man suddenly got up and shuffled rapidly into the stinking urinal at the side of the room. The extra half liter was already working on him. Winston sat for a minute or two, gazing at his empty glass and hardly noticed when his feet carried him out into the streets again. Within twenty years at most, he reflected, the huge and simple question, was life better before the revolution than it is now, would have ceased once and for all to be answerable. But in effect, it was unanswerable even now, since the scattered few survivors from the ancient world were incapable of comparing one age with another. They remembered a million useless things. A quarrel with a workmate, a hunt for a lost bicycle pump, the expression on a long dead sister's face, the swirls of dust on a windy morning seventy years ago. But all the relevant facts were outside the range of their vision. They were like the ant, which could see small objects but not large ones. And when the memory failed and written records were falsified, when that happened, the claim of the party to have improved the conditions of human life has got to be accepted, because there did not exist, and never could again exist, any standard against which it could be tested.